Right, everyone. Uh, this is our penultimate talk before lunch, uh, penultimate lightning talk. So we have Guillaume Roger with us, who will talk about Blair uh, policy-based intrusion detection system. Once again, enjoy the talk. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to talk to you about Blair. Uh, it's a family of two of uh, intrusion detection systems. And it's developed at the CIDRE team in Supelec in France. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about the IT security context and then a bit more about information flow tracking. Present uh, what we're doing at the, well, we work in the Linux kernel, so what we're doing there. And then uh, I'll show you a small demonstration and then just conclude with a few uh, things that we want to do with this. Uh, so first of all, well, we try to work in the traditional IT security context, so that means well, usually you've got uh, a few tools to try to protect your system. So you've got access control. Uh, you can do static analysis or whatever. But uh, whatever you do, you know that you still probably remain vulnerable because it's very hard. The, com the systems are very complex and it's very difficult to control everything. So, well, intrusions occur, sadly, and it's good to have some intrusion detection system so that, well, if they occur, you still know about it and you can try to do something about it. So that at least maybe next time it won't occur or something. And then, so, what, what do I say, what, what do I mean when I say intrusion? So intrusions can be anything from, uh, well, attacking a vulnerable website to someone somehow infecting your PC with a root key or something. And then, Whatever those intrusions are, usually you still have some two very common characteristics of those intrusions. That, well, someone intrudes, uh, intrudes on your computer for some reason, and the, info, and the reason is usually to modify some information. So someone who is not authorized to modify some information will try to do that, or to leak some information from your system to the outside. So what we are going to try to do with the information, with intrusion detection, is usually we monitor the system. So we read one or several data sources, and then we analyze that, that, that data and we try to detect when the when an intrusion occurs. And there's actually two ways of doing that. It's either you uh, modelize what a detect what, what an intrusion is. So that means that beforehand you know what kind of intrusion can occur, and then you know that if you see this and that pattern, then there's probably an intrusion. Or you can try to modelize the normal behavior of the system. So that means that you know how the system behaves, and then if it starts behaving weirdly, then there's probably something wrong, and we consider that an intrusion. Uh, an intrusion. So that's it's this second part that we're going to be uh, trying to do. And for that, we're going to use information flow tracking. So what's the idea behind information flow tracking? Well, we've got a system with objects in it. So for example, if it's a, an OS, then you've got files, you've got processes. And these objects will uh, exchange information over the, life, the lifetime of the system. So what you want to do is uh, attach tags, or well, we've, we put colors here. Uh, on those containers, on, on those uh, objects in your in your system, and then you try to follow where the information con first contained in, in those uh, objects goes through, so that at the end, when you look at your system, you know well that red information ended up in the C5 container. So that's the idea behind uh, information flow tracking. To do that, well, we obviously need uh, what we call information tags, which basically contain the meta. They, they do not contain the information, but they contain information about the information that tells you, well, this this information is of uh, well kind A, and then that information is of kind B, and um, so it's this information that you're going to propagate over the lifetime of the system, so that you can follow uh, the the information flows. And then if you want to have a policy on these flows, well, obviously you need some kind of way of specifying that policy. So what you need to do is define, well, we've got this and this container, and this container should be able to contain information A and B, 
but we don't want to ever see information of type C in that container, whereas the second container can contain any kind of information. So you can set up a policy like that so that you can protect the, uh, the confidentiality and integrity of your system. So right now, uh, Blair is actually a family of uh, IDSs. We've got it working in a Java virtual machine. So that means that you can uh, follow, follow the information flow throughout the life of a... Of a and we modified the Java virtual machine, so you don't have to modify the actual program. So you can run uh, your vanilla uh, Java software and it, you can follow the information flow through that. And then we modified the Linux kernel, so that's what I'm going to talk a bit more in, de in detail afterwards. And since the Android kernel is based off the Linux kernel, we also got it working on the Android uh, kernel, which uses a bit, uh, well, some different uh, technologies. So it was a bit of work, but it's not that much. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how we implemented that in the in the in the Linux kernel. So. What we do is we track the information flow at runtime. So we're, we're, the kernel, we're inside the kernel, and we can only see what the kernel sees. So we're in that uh, black square, and we've got all these applications talking with each other, talking on the network, uh, writing to files, and whatever. And we want to follow all these information flows, but we don't know what happens inside the, uh, applications themselves. So we've got two types of tags. The first one is information tag. So if you remember, that was a colored tag that basically contains the meta information about the uh, information inside the file. And we need to update this tag each time uh, there's an inform information flow. So that, for example, if we have a file which uh, contains content, and then we know that content is of type uh, is a type of content one. Then, if we try to copy that file, well, first there's a, a copy uh, process that is created, and then it's going to read the content of the file, be tagged with uh, one, because, well, it now contains the content of the file. And then, when it writes to the new file, then that new file is going to be tagged with the same one I tag. So that means that we can trace, trace the origin of the, of the content. And then we have policy tags, which enable us to, um, to well, set up a policy on, in our system. So these uh, meta information are not propagated. They are set up at the beginning of, a, of the, before launching the system, and uh, they don't change. Well, you could change them if you wanted, but you'd have to do it manually. So what we do is we let the information flow happen, the, and then, once the information flow has happened and that we have uh, updated the information tag, then we check to see if the current uh, content uh, contained in the file is still legal. So for example, if we have a file which still contains contents and which has uh, information tag 1 and a policy tag of uh, 1, 2 or 1, 3, then that content is legal. Is legal. So the policy tag is actually a set of sets. And if we want uh, the information tag to be uh, legal, then it has to be contained in one of the sets contained in the, in, in the policy tags. So for example, if we have information of type 2, which is written in, in a file with policy tag 1, 2, or 1, 3, then that's legal. If we have information of type 3, once again, it's legal. But if we have information on, of type 2 and 3, then once we put in the file 1, then we have an alert. Because file 1 can contain 1 or 2, 1 and 2 or 1 and 3, but not 2 and 3 at the same time. So the way we implement this is that we use the uh, Linux security mod module framework, which was uh, first used for SE Linux. So basically, you have a number of hooks uh, on system calls that you can hook on. And uh, whenever you go through those system calls, uh, your, sec your security module is, be is being called by the kernel. 
So from those hooks, we tried to infer flow. And uh, we also had to add a couple hooks so that the, well, the, the hooks are made for a mandatory access control. But what we're doing is a bit different. So we had to add a few hooks so that we could follow flows uh, more accurately. So in terms of uh, lines of code, we've got about 7,000 lines of codes in a few files. But they're all in the same folder. So it's very easy to maintain for us. And we just needed to edit a few files so that the Linux kernel knows about our modules and uh, can compile it. And you can, well, it's added in the, when you make your, your con config file, then you can just add the, the option and it gets compiled in. So that's great on one host, but uh, Blair can actually work as a distributed uh, host-based uh, intrusion detection system. So what we do is we level network packets. So we, for that, we use the commercial IP security options. And so we just label the packets, and then when the other host receives it, he can just read the, the labels and put on the information. Uh, so that's cool, but that means that both systems need to run Blair. And one of the things is uh, we, right now we have 230 bits that we can use, so we're using it very naively. So each bit is, represents one tag, so that's fine for our simulations. But what we really need is uh, some kind of a distributed security token management system so that we can use any number of tags and not just be limited to 240 tags. But that second part hasn't been implemented yet. So I'm going to show a small demonstration of uh, what we can do with uh, Blair with a distributed system. So we, we're going to have one web server with uh, two virtual hosts and one database server. And one, one of the two virtual hosts is actually vulnerable and is also accessible to the uh, outside internet. So we're going to tag each uh, files in the virtual host with a different tag. So for virtual host one, we're going to add one, two for virtual host two. And then we're going to tag also the Apache two uh, executable file and the PHP uh, shared library. The same thing for the database. So we're using WordPress. So we have a, a database for the users and for the, the posts for each of the websites. Um, and actually, since we're using PostgreSQL, we can, use, we can know which file uh, is uh, which database. So well, each table in the database. So that's why we used uh, PostgreSQL. And we need to put that policy on the exec executable files. So that means that when, a, when an executable is going to read the data, so either Apache or PostgreSQL is going to read the data on a, well, either a file on a, to serve as a, as a web page or data in the database, then the data is going to be tainted and we can check the policy to check that. So the policy says that we can either have data from 1, 5, and 6, which is website 1, or 2, 7, and 8, which is website 2, but we cannot sh share that data. And um, the uh, negative tag is actually a cool feature of, uh, of Blair is in that when you execute a, f um, when you execute a f uh, a pr uh, an executable file, then you create a process. But instead of saying, well, that process was, of was spawned from file with a type of 2, so it's stained with data 2, we say it's stained with data minus 2. And that we know that it was actually executed data and not just standard data. So that means that we can uh, refine the policy a bit. So, So we have our two hosts at the top, and then that's just a Metasploit. So we're going to use, a, it's a known vulnerability, so it's easy to exploit. So we're going to see uh, uh, war like uh, warnings popping up in the top two consoles. So what I do is basically I just uh, exploit the, the vulnerable plugin in WordPress. And then once I get a shell, I just can do whatever I want. So I connect to the, to the database server. 
And once I realize there's actually two websites on the, on the same host, I can connect to database server and get the passwords, well, the hash for the passwords for the private website. So right now, we just got a shell. Uh, we realize there's WordPress and WordPress 2. So we get all the information for the database for the first website, same thing for the second website. And then uh, already we see that since we've read files from the two websites at the same time, uh, well, on the same process, we already have uh, policy violation alerts on, uh, on the first host. And then once we read the data on the second host, then we get uh, errors, uh, well, policy evaluation edits on the second host too, because the process asking uh, PostgreSQL to, uh, to read the data is already tainted with one and two, and so that violates the policy for PostgreSQL too. So, yeah, that's it. So if we look at the, if we capture packets uh, in, in Wireshark, Shark, then we can see that the, there's actually tags uh, 110, 115, 116, 120, 21, 23. So like I said, we have 240 bytes. So 120 is actually one, and 119 is zero. So we've got minus, uh, minus nine, minus three, well, minus four, minus three, one, two and then uh, four. That's a uh, packet going from the, that's the, f the packet that triggered the alert on, on the PostgreSQL host. So, well, one of the advantages of uh, this kind of information is that, uh, of this kind of uh, intrusion detection system is that we can uh, detect, uh, we, we know which type of information has leaked very easily because, well, it's already in the, in the policy violation alert. And we can, so we know very easily what, what was the target of the attack. Uh, one of the problems is that we can see inside the uh, processes. So we have to make a lot of uh, over approximation. So for example, processes with, which is gonna read a lot of, uh, of uh, files and then just talk with a lot of other processes is gonna taint the system very fast. And that's, that's one of the big problems we have with uh, buses because we get just tags everywhere and then we've got a lot of uh, false positives. So what we want to do is be able to follow what happens in, the, in those uh, processes. So that's what we did with the, uh, the Java virtual machine. Which, so now the kernel can talk to the Java virtual machine and the Java virtual machine uh, follows the, the flow of information and then tells the kernel what happens. So it's still a bit experimental but it kind of works. And then, so we need to somehow be able to talk with the processes, which with, it'd be easier if we could talk with every kind of processes, but right now we can only do it with, uh, with Java. So, well, thank you for listening. If you want more information, we have a website with all the source code and everything. And, well, that's the end of the talk. <laughs> Fantastic. Just on time. Right, uh, any questions from the audience? We've got a couple of minutes. Yes. Hi. Um, in um, the Blade uh, system, uh, I I must uh, I can use uh, uh, rules of uh, emergent read. Of, sorry, what kind of rules? Rules uh, uh, of uh, the um, uh, community of uh, emergent read. Emerg Open source uh, community for um, uh, the, the rules uh, um, for Snort and Suricada. Um, emergent read. Actually, right now we, you have to put the rules by hand by yourself. Uh, we're working on something to adapt uh, as, uh, app armor rules to like app armor policy to Blair policies. But uh, right now, the only tools we have is you say by hand which file, on which file you want to put which policy. Um, it's kind of uh, arduous work right now, but um, that's the way to do it. 
we need to work on something that could use uh, well already known uh, like well databases uh, of vulnerabilities and things like that to set up policies easily, but we don't have that yet. Thanks. Right. Um, I'm afraid that's all the time we had for questions here. So if you have any questions for Guillaume, please uh, chase him again outside the room or at the front here. And uh, Guillaume Bougie, everyone, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And the next talk will start just in a couple of minutes.